I'm super excited to be joined by Johan. And Johan, thank you so much for taking the time. Thank you so much for having me. Let's go uh, all the way back. You're brought up in a small Swedish town. Tell me a bit about your home place and what's the best part of growing up there. Yeah, so uh, actually I've grown up uh, outside Varberg on the west coast of uh, uh, of Sweden. So it's uh, south of Gothenburg. It's like 35 minutes by train. So it, it's actually um, a town where like the majority of all shoes passing into Sweden goes from our hometown. Uh, it uh, uh, has a heritage uh, from uh, a lot of small tech companies and also uh, retail companies. And uh, also the access to Gothenburg within 35 minutes, uh, I think it's uh, very advantageous for us. Um, but uh, if you look at the size of the city, it's 100,000 people. It's uh, it's a place where most people come uh, during the summer for their holiday. How early did you find an interest in either business or entrepreneurship? Was it growing up or did it come later in life? Um, it was actually during my school period, I think. It, um, it was a topic that um, we used to discuss a lot among friends and uh, so I actually was on a path going to like um, being a software engineer and studying at, at the Chalmers University, but I changed path uh, during like the last year and um, um, I decided to go for marketing and business instead, uh, but I actually didn't finish it off. I just did one year and after that I was um recruited to uh, a company that scaled the retail business from like five five stores to 15 and it was a really good good start in my career because we had huge freedom to to do what we believed in during that journey and um and four years after that we me and one of uh, uh, one of the store uh, store manager there actually started advertising it ourselves. We, we wanted to do our own journey at that point. To tell us about that moment when you decided to change the path of going the other way and you said, okay, I'm going to try this route instead. Was it anything in particular that made you, you decide to change path or was it just a combination of many things? I, I think it was a combination of many things, but uh, the, the fundamental was that we had a very interesting period in this three years scaling that business but actually the, the business was in better shape when it was like two three stores than it was after 15 stores because the the, um, the scaling of the business um was uh, when they started to scale it was never profitable again um, and also at that point uh, the founder that was really like the energy in the company uh, become uh, uh, sick. Uh, so these two things that we didn't really saw that it had a bright future and also that uh, the founder Benny there that was the, the like great entrepreneur uh, was out of the picture. That was the two main things. So, so, so when you have this idea for what I said, is it is it one particular moment where you have the sort of aha moment or is it an, an idea that sort of grows over time? And then it's like the timing aspect that you say, okay, now is the right time to try this idea or how, how did it that look like? Actually, it was, uh, I was the purchasing manager in this company and uh, we had the store manager for one of the stores. Uh, we uh, it was close to the headquarters, so we had breakfast every day at the cafe <laughs> cafeteria. Uh, so we discussed a lot of, you know, we were both mutually interested in in business, and uh, so we discussed a lot of business ideas at the time. Uh, so the first thing we decided upon was that we need to do something ourselves, <laughs> uh, and uh, we had a lot of ideas. We discussed during a year, I think, but. It was one thing that like sticked to us then we um, and that was that the digital transformation that just started um, we said that this need to affect thing that is outside the computer and you know in 2007 it was like the uh, people didn't have iphones since we so <laughs> so uh, so um, 
but but we really saw that this will have an effect. So we started to work in the, uh, for a half a year to do the planning, to write, write the business plan, go to the bank and try to find financing. And, and then um, uh, and then we just came to a point that we said, this is nothing we could do during the weekends. This is 100% or not. Um, so um, we took as big loan as we could on the bank. Uh, I sold my car. <laughs> we, we quit our jobs. Uh, and uh, just went from there, three three guys in my apartment. That's very, very interesting. I mean, so during this time, we also have the financial crisis coming to us as well. Did that have an impact at all or not? Because you guys are in Sweden and you are not really that, you know, affected by the financial crisis. That generally it definitely, started in US. It definitely had. Um, it, it could be a long story, but the, the good thing was that we secured like financing um, before uh, like end 2007. So uh, we, we took a loan of 1 million Swedish crown from Almi, it's like a, a state backed, uh, and uh, 1 million from the local, uh, local bank where we took a 100% guarantee ourselves, private. Um, and um, if if that would have been like six months later, uh, uh, it wouldn't have been possible at that time. So um, uh, that was a good timing. But also after a year when we started to get business, <laughs> then it was hard to get finance at that stage, even, even though we actually were profitable the first year. Uh, we had a hard time like financing uh, the company after that. Uh, because it was still still really like freezed when it comes to the opportunity to take up loans. Uh, but we managed to solve that as well. Quarter is the new way of doing company research. Their first mission is to enable access to conference calls, investor presentations, transcripts and earnings reports. Their second mission is to create a completely new way for companies to reach their investors and vice versa. Quarter is 100% free. They include companies from 15 markets today and plan to add more. They prioritize requested companies and users can now leave reactions while listening to the conference calls. So make sure to follow them on Twitter at Quarter App. Let's talk about product market fit. Obviously, you were going in the retail industry. You had this, okay, digitalization. Obviously, that's a massive trend. And it's the famous saying of that you need to have a niche, target a niche first, and then you can grow the market with that niche. But how, how did that journey look for you guys? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. We um, Actually, the only thing that we saw that was the like digital communication uh, will impact how we interact with each other and how we communicate in the public space. So um, from the beginning, we were, we were looking at so many different verticals uh, um, but the first thing we went into to take a niche was digital out of home it's outdoor advertising uh, it, it was good because people started to put up like led screens that they imported from asia but we uh, we said we want to do the backbone we want to do the booking system how to price campaign how to schedule based on share of voice how to calculate the reach all of this, how to uh, like configure and quotes. Um, and uh, after three years, we said we have 80% market share. Um, but uh, the what we didn't tell was that the market was only 150 screens in Sweden. <laughs> so it was like the worst, worst market to be like the number one in. Uh, so at that point, uh, we needed to decide, should we go international? Uh, we did a lot of home business. Uh, or should we broaden into other verticals? Uh, and uh, for many reasons, we, we choose to broaden because we, we were too small and it was uh, too big uh, differences between the market, how, how you work with like measure the, those type of campaigns. So uh, we did a lot of verticals, uh, public, corporate, retail, advertising, and five years later, uh, we actually have 85% of our revenue from a customer meeting. So then we, then we focused on uh, retail where we are today. So now we do digital in-store solutions to really enhance the customer experience in-store 
to bridge the customer journey from online to like in person in the store. Is there any lessons from landing those first few clients? Because obviously that's a very hard task to do when you're just starting out, I guess. Yeah, uh, like we we really built the company from like stone by stone. So um, we like been profitable the whole journey. We like really bootstrapped strategy. We took like the local pizzeria as one of our first customers. So we went from like the local pizzeria to Porsche globally <laughs> and everything in there in between. Um, and uh, we, um, also like I was 24 years old when I started the company. So I think it, it's also it's also a journey where you need to grow the business, where you grow yourself as an entrepreneur and, uh, and grow the team and your skills. And so I think it's it's a it's a lot of good things with growing a company over time, um, and also to always try to be profitable. In uh, of course there are arguments where you need to invest a lot of money, take the market like Spotify for example. But in a, in most cases, <laughs> at least I think it it's better to do business that are profitable because in so many cases it's really hard to change from like not being profitable and only only like focus on market share and try to change that back to a model where you are profitable it would be really really hard i agree uh, <clears throat> i know this is a very hard question to answer but so many companies that start fail after two or three years and don't exist anymore on the one hand i guess that's a good thing because it's a, it's a bit bad being stuck in a business that isn't going nowhere, right? Spending 10 years of your life sort of trying to make it survive year by year. So, of course, some businesses should stop. But do you have any specific insight into why you believe so many companies can survive those first few years? Uh, obviously, there are many things. Uh, of course, it takes to... You need to reach a certain size where you can carry your own cost. I think that's almost like the hardest thing is like to get your first and your second employee that's uh, in my opinion i think uh, companies that have like reached like five employees are the heroes <laughs> it it's so so much work uh, until you reach that level but um, if you look from a strategic perspective i think one thing that we agreed on was to, like have a clear path where do we want to be so like clear view on vision, uh, clear view on like the business models, but and but not to be to have a recipe for like the next quarter. <laughs> so you need to know like maybe we need to do this consultancy work that is not core in our business model now. Uh, we, but we need to know that we're out of. Uh, we, we're driving a little bit like outside the road, the main road, uh, but we know that we're doing it because it, it will actually benefit us. Like we will get the cash from that business and you can allow yourself to, to drive outside the road if you know you're doing it. Uh, but most, uh, com if I look at uh, many companies that are like um, uh, helped uh, in different ways, uh, they they like change their whole their whole like business ID twice a year, and I think that's that's really that's really tough. If you change your business ID, if you change your uh, change your vision business model too often, uh, then then you will have uh, like uh, problem. And also if you have like, this is my business idea. This is the plan. This is exactly the step that I will take. Then most likely you don't take enough feedback from the customers. So I think be, be like strict on the long-term path, be strict on like business model, but be flexible and adaptive to the market where you're acting and listen to your customers. It's, is sort of the concept that we try to, uh, to use. And then it has been uh, beneficial for us. 
I mean, I couldn't agree more. I think it all goes back to that. Uh, I think it's the uh, Andreessen saying that be stubborn on the wish, vision and flexible in, in the details. So I definitely agree with you. Uh, if we go over to the retail industry, can you just quickly explain where you believe retail is today? Because obviously it's changed a lot during COVID. And also, like, how do you view the retail market going forward as well? Yeah, it's a super interesting topic. And it, it's a lot of uh, trends going on. But uh, if you, if you uh, look before COVID, we really saw how a pattern where more and more business went into like the online channels um, and um, what, what retailers struggled with was that their model and how they, uh, their offering to the market really didn't match with how consumer behaved. So, and we also like treated every channel specially. So it could, um, it was like you have the online store and you have the physical store. But um, the, the most important thing to have in mind is that a customer never see themselves as a re uh, online customer or a brick and mortar customer. <laughs> they see themselves as a customer for, for a brand. Uh, and uh, different channels, really support different needs so if we take a like really simple uh, example and um, if you order food from your favorite restaurant at home um, it might be the same dish but it's it it offers you something else than uh, like visiting the restaurant and eating there with your friends you know so so um it and, and that's the way you should look at, at retail, that maybe I, I need to go to the store to have someone that could help me find the right running shoes. Uh, uh, but when I, when I have found my right running shoes, maybe I make the repeat order online, you know? But so the customer, uh, you need to look at what are the, like, what are the real purpose and the offering with your different channels. Um, and um, our aim there is, of course, making it all work together. So you can say on the, the big trends, if we come back to that, the stores are moving from transaction to service and uh, inspiration and uh, uh, a way of experience a brand um, in, in many ways. You could also see another big trend that is direct to consumer uh, that uh, multi-channel retailers suffer and uh, the one that uh, t take advantage and the one that grows now are brands moving in with their own online channels and their own retail facilities. So Nike is a great example. They went from 10% direct sell to consumer to 40% direct sales to consumer in just three years. And they have left like the big online platforms and uh, focus purely on their own their own uh, online channels. And they have terminated 80% of the, their re resellers in the physical world and invested in like Nike stores uh, on global scale. So, um, and also new car brands, if you look at Polestar, for example, they go like they have uh, they have an online model and they build brand stores um, um, so so that's that's a huge uh, trend uh, as well uh, so so what what do we see we we still see in trend reports that five years from now uh, brick and mortar will have 75 percent of the turnover uh, and for me it doesn't matter if it's 75 or 50 percent of the turnover uh, because the, the important thing for us is that the uh, online and the physical are still two important channels that needs to work together. It's because that's where we are. Uh, and if it also have an effect that the stores are getting smaller, um, it also means that you need to have digital solutions to be able to offer your full range uh, through like digital touch points. And, for some fa fashion brands that we work with now, uh, Gillindeberg, for example, 10% of their in-store sales is from the online assortment. So maybe you try 
try a black jacket and order a blue one in your size. Interesting. Um, maybe it's easier to use a concrete example that you've seen, but is it possible to sort of define the ultimate customer experience from a brand perspective? Um, really interesting. I, th I think it's it's uh, you need you you need to look at it from like brand to brand. Uh, but um, if we if we look at Volvo now, for example, they they want to take back like the they want you to buy the Volvo car from Volvo, not the dealer. And um, that's based on how they look on the customer journey and how people behave. Uh, and uh, it's, I, I think it's a good example. If you map it, like most likely you start in the sofa to like explore and maybe you start to configure a new car in the sofa at home. And uh, when you come to the, to the dealership, you don't want to go to a desk to a salesperson that uh, and you, because you maybe are not ready to like buy a car. And if you sit on a desk, that's the expectation. So in that case, we want to have um, uh, places where you can stand to, uh, to really continue to configure on the car and explore the car that you built at home. And then you can do it mutually because you, have, you might have seen the experience where you sit on a desk and they show you sometimes and ask you questions and you need to restart the customer journey because you already invested two hours at home. So you need to be able to continue the journey yourself or with a sales associate uh, and together like um, finalize uh, the car in this case. And then after that, uh, you need to have the right tools for the sales staff to be relevant for you in that customer meeting. So maybe they, they need to have digital tools to so, uh, be able to answer questions on environmental questions, financing, related services, or how uh, add-on on the car add value in your life. Um, and after that, we also in this journey implemented like accessory sales that uh, was really weak uh, before. So you could like find the right uh, accessories to your car based on the car that you configure and your lifestyle. Um, and also after that, uh, during the period where you wait on your car, you get the emails, information, where you can start to explore and learn more about the features you have in the car. And then you have a point of delivery where, where we have a personalized experience where you really have an agenda that is based on you as a customer and the, the car. We, so we know what we should show you because if you have features that you paid for and we don't introduce you to them, that is a really bad experience. And also if they try to uh, to show you features that you don't have, <laughs> it's also really bad. So um, that, that's, that's one example. So I think uh, it, it, if you take the new car customer journey and take it from start to finish, it's, it's logic. Uh, but but uh, I need to, like, if you can take on the customer's eyes, see that some things you do at home, you start browsing at homes, you, you continue to talk to the brand when you wait for your car uh, at home. And when you visit the, the dealership, for example, you need, you need to be able to continue the journey. And um, of course, the delivery moment is really interesting. And after that, you continue the life with a relationship to Volvo, with uh, uh, with all the services that they offer, yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, it's a very good good example because obviously there's a huge difference between the needs to a family of five worried about safety versus a guy that wants to ski all over Norway and Sweden and have yeah. like a car to to use that for. But the other question I would I would love to ask is that obviously you are positioning your company in a field where many companies can say the same to clients because you also say that you want to increase sales, you want to increase the magic and you want to increase loyalty. Obviously that pitch can come from a lot of different companies and those companies can be competitors or they can have synergies to each other. But talk a bit about, about that, that market in general because having worked for those companies that get pitched by those types of companies, there are many companies saying that we can increase your sales and we can increase loyalty. 
Yeah. Um, I, I think it's really weak. Uh, the pitch that we will increase, if you, if you buy this, you will increase your sales with this. Is almost always a lie. <laughs> because if you if you go back to like the basics in in retail if you if you you always know that it it's of course the sign even if it's a printed sign of course it has an impact on the size of the sign <laughs> and how how it visually looks uh, it also like where is it in uh, if you go the journey in the store and and how the products are exposed and what product it is and what price it is and so, on, so, so it's always a combination of so many factors uh, so that there is not not like one single answer um, um, on that one and um, so the things um, i don't like like consultancy going into the companies to say uh, change or die and uh, with our offering, you will increase sales or loyalty with 15%. Uh, that goes away. So we, um, our say is like uh, more or less, we, we could, let's, let's take a look on um, how your business uh, looks now, how the customer journey looks, uh, your off value proposition, your offering, and we could together see like what digital touch points could enhance the customer experience and uh, add value in your business. And we do that together with the customer because they know their business best. And uh, then for each and every touch point, if you have, we design like, what is the purpose? What is the situation where the customer are? What is the communication? Uh, what technology do we need? And what is the KPI to measure? And uh, to come back to the measurement point, I think we need to try and then measure. I think people start sometimes to look at, at like the measurement points instead of believing in something. I think have have an idea, uh, trust that idea, and measure the result. <laughs> uh, and uh, and that said, if you look at things that are related to the brand experience, it's really hard to measure. <clears throat> on one hand, if you come to tactic communication. Like go from uh, in Burger King case, go from uh, people think about Whopper, but you want to sell the campaign meal. It's easy to like measure uh, how you can uh, convert people by upselling. Um, it's easy. Um, it's also easy to see um, if you have, for example, endless aisle like e-commerce sales in store is easy to measure. So when it's uh, transaction oriented, it's easy to measure. Uh, touch point by touch point. When it's brand experience, you need to measure it uh, on the concept as a whole. It's also hard to measure like the sofa or the premium lighting system. <laughs> Definitely. That's a perfect segue to your business model because obviously it's become a big business model, but maybe one of the key aspects is this SaaS offering. How can you tell it? How can you describe that model? Yeah, so um, what we're talked about now is really <clears throat> like what digital <coughs> solutions can can create the value in the customer's business. Um, if you look at it from our perspective, uh, like what, what is our business model is it's three parts. Um, because we, we come from a path where we have been like a full service provider in Sweden. And obviously now we, we're, we change this when we go on the international. I will come back to that. But so it starts with a consultancy work. And uh, the consultancy work is project based, or we can have retainers to enhance the solution over time. Um, uh, and then we need to deliver like the equipment needed, uh, the displays and the technology um, for to make it happen in reality. Um, but we charge like a license for every touch point. Uh, per month for license and support. And uh, so it's quite simple. If we can have happy customers that grow with their solution over time, we keep the customers, then we will will grow the recurring, rev uh, recurring revenue all the time. Uh, and actually, we that this has been our focus all the time to keep customers uh, happy, uh, like adding real business value to them. Because if we do that, we know that they will expand the solution. Uh, and uh, 
the proof point of this is that we have grown the ARR uh, in uh, 39 quarters in a row. So one more quarter and it's uh, a 10 year streak. So, uh, uh, so that that's uh, that's really good and so our mindset is always like we don't want to do like the fireworks because uh, after um, after a year they they want to do new fireworks in the flagship stores <laughs> uh, we will be like moving away so we want to do the things that are like scalable for 400 stores uh, maybe not always that uh, cool but we know that the, the things that they scale for 400 stores, uh, it's applications that really add value for the customer and that will last over time. Uh, I mean, that's a super interesting point because there's a big difference between getting one flag store, um, store super nice versus having the whole portfolio of stores working together. So obviously uh, serving that problem is a much better solutions uh, solution uh, looking at sort of just a customer experience last question it's it's obviously easy to be fascinated by apple and tesla and you can you can pretty easily make an argument that they have cracked you know the code of creating big brands and especially apple is well known for their stores are you inspired by those brands as well or is it are you, there other brands that you're more inspired of uh, we always look and I think we always, we are super nerdy when it comes to retail, of course, and I think we, we, we spend a lot of time like discussing all new brands that are coming into the market and different approaches that they have. But um, the, the brands that you point at right now with Tesla and Apple, it's, I, I think that's where things are heading right now, that you really have like a clear, clear value proposition, a clear brand and uh, brand offering, and um, that the people can relate to. And um, I think it will continue on the path where brands uh, really gain in comparison to 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 like uh, multi-brand retailers. That said, I think there will be a comeback because not many brands can offer you the full solution. Uh, maybe Nike can offer you everything when it comes to running and baseball and football and so on, but many brands are too small. So there are also huge opportunities for, for being like the niche player for running or for skiing or for uh, where, where you really could, could like build a portfolio of brands to, to present. Uh, so I think uh, that might be the next uh, the next thing that will happen in the market. That you have new, better position full service provider that let the brands talk to themselves, but in in the in the place where uh, they strengthen each other. Well, we haven't talked about uh, demographics at all. Is there anything very interesting that you would like to just talk about? Because there is a big difference between Gen Z and millennials and baby boomers, etc. Are you seeing anything that makes you really curious? Yeah, um, but actually, I think it's in different different part of your life also, um, because you could also see that people that grown up with like internet and being like the majority of their purchase online, uh, when they become um, a little bit older, they have more money uh, to spend, they start to work and so on. They also prefer to spending less less time and also invest more in, in, uh, in, in products that they really love. So um, I, I actually, actually I, I think you, the, you, I don't think the differences are that big as when you read reports <laughs> about it. Um, um, I think it's more individual and I think it's, it's more about what, what market you're in. I get it. Uh, let's talk about the, um, the journey or the time where you, you had the sort of epiphany that 
we need to scale in Europe because we are in the market where maybe there will be few winners and now is the time to really scale because we touched upon the product market fit and having a very nice growth trajectory. But there is a point here where you say that, okay, we need to scale for real now. Can you talk, can you just go through that, um, that process? Yeah, uh, absolutely. What, what we, what we saw that there was a very, uh, a new market, a lot of player went into the field in, I, I think I have a PowerPoint presentation where 30, 30 competitors in Sweden only. <laughs> so, uh, but the companies were like zero to five people. Um, and, um, but we saw that it was, it was really not many of them made, made it as always in the market. And it, it was uh, really a lot of acquisitions going on to consolidate the market. And uh, we were actually in a good position where we we were profitable and had the opportunity to acquire companies that actually didn't made it uh, at that time. So we bought the actually the the customer base. It was no strategic acquisitions. It was not the people, not the product, but actually what we want uh, was the the customer base. And then we figured out that uh, this this market had really high barriers to change supplier uh, because you have a platform that is integrated to data, you have customer specific applications, and then you have also physical devices that are uh, with software that are connected to the cloud. Uh, so, um, so after some acquisitions, we saw that, yeah, we always grow even on the acquired customer base. Uh, so that make, of course, it has with our offering to do, but to be honest, it has, has really much to do with uh, with the barriers also. So, um, um, and what we have seen now in the market is that it's the same pattern in uh, Europe, especially when it comes to the full service provider that do uh, strategy, that do hardware, and, uh, and also offer software their own or another uh, independent software vendors. Um, so we looked at other industries, what has happened there. And you can see that all markets that uh, become mature get category winners and they get more and more specialized. Uh, so we said that we, if you look at e-commerce, for example, if you have WooCommerce, uh, Magento, <laughs> Shopify, then after a while you have uh, they had like 75% of the market share or so, uh, the big five. Um, and uh, also you can look at iGaming or whatever uh, market uh, <laughs> that you have uh, specialized vendors in, in different fields of uh, the value chain. Uh, so we said, where do we want to be in this value chain? We can't be like a full service provider globally. Uh, so we said, we want to be the platform uh, we want to be the category winner within in-store experience management. Uh, so, and so we looked at the, the we looked at the market, and we also said that the acquisitions would be bigger than they are today. So that was the decision why we went public. Uh, so we uh, did an IPO uh, two years ago on the, in in Stockholm First North, uh, Nasdaq First North. And uh, the purpose of that was to be able to access capital to continue to acquire companies because we saw that acquisitions become bigger and bigger, and we will not have the capacity with our own cash flow to manage that. Um, and um, then we identified like the best uh, competitor when it comes to uh, when it comes to the platform side of the business. So we did a big acquisition before the summer of grassfish in uh, Vienna in uh, they were the number one in the duck region um, so we went from 65 people to uh, 130 people overnight what's the uh, what's the hardest part of scaling in your opinion i know it's a lot of things but you have hiring you have culture you have acquisition how do, what do you think is the hardest part of scaling in the right way it's uh, it's a really good question. I, I think 
as as long as long as you can like have a really good culture in place and uh, and you can find like you could say middle management with like a handful of people that when you go from yourself being involved in any new business <laughs> being involved in all operational uh, decisions that need to be taken on a daily basis uh, the the biggest um uh, the, the best thing you could achieve is to have like a, a set of people that could act uh, as middle management and really like uh, duplicate <laughs> duplicate that um, i think that that's that's the most important uh, step uh, to achieve so how would you describe your culture and how have you tried to enforce it or make the whole organization act in a similar way um it's i i think we're one thing that unites us is that we are really like obsessed in like creating value for the customer so what a lot of companies can say the the other thing that um, it's it we have a culture where you need to have a lot of like diversity when it comes to uh, knowledge of people uh, and really to trust in that um, and that's easier than it sounds so but we need to have um, strategists that could ha have a workshop with the best retailers there is <laughs> we need to have uh, ux designers developers motion designers art directors we have support technicians we have supply chain people uh, and and uh, was, uh, of course a sales organization with different profiles so we have a huge variety of uh, people and and uh, you need to embrace the uh, you need to embrace uh, the diversity of people and that culture but you also need to trust uh, in each other so that's that's really at the core of uh, what we see and there is a huge trust uh, that uh, I, I never heard someone like raise their voice to another person at the office. It's never happened. Interesting. If we look at uh, retail, let's take Europe. What do you think is the biggest lesson Europe can learn from Asia? Because I remember when I was looking at trends in retail, there was always something crazy going on in Asia. And obviously they're so digital native that they have sort of almost feels like they've come further than Europeans when it comes to using digital products, at least. Yeah, and uh, I think it's curiosity and they are brave to like try. Um, it's um, it's too much, much talk and too less trying in Europe. Um, um, I, I, um, we usually say that in the office, it's, it's like core of what we need to solve for the retailers. It's getting, take the step from, uh, from the strategy and from the PowerPoint into the reality and into the customer meeting where it happens. And in China and Asia, they're much better on this. They, they try and try and try and try, like uh, where, where it happens. And uh, that's the biggest, uh, biggest thing. Uh, so uh, I also used to travel a lot in, uh, especially into China. Um, and uh, that fascinates me all the time that um, they really dare, dare to try new things. It's not so polished, but they dare to try. And I think they learn a lot from that. And um, I, I think they will benefit so much 10 years from now from uh, having the ability to try agree <laughs> so uh, you set some very ambitious goals and you managed to reach them i don't know one or two years before time so even like so are you setting the bar too low or are you just like going over expectations T talk to us about those goals you reached yeah um we went when we went public we said we we have still a small company. We have uh, 25 million Swedish crown in, uh, in era or so. Um, and we said that uh, three years from now, we will double it. Uh, and uh, we also want to have one of the largest uh, retail brands in a global rollout. Um, and actually, um, due to the acquisition of Grossfish and uh, 
we managed to achieve them uh, one and a half year uh, in advance. So now we're at 66 million in ARR and we aim for 200 uh, in the end of uh, 2024. And uh, 2026, uh, we want to be the number one in-store experience management platform uh, on a global scale. Uh, so it's, uh, it's ambitious goals, but it's definitely doable. And, uh, but what we, what we said when we went public, we said that we want to act as we do now. Um, uh, and so we, we want to communicate the same goals like to the market as we really believe in ourselves. And we want the goals to correlate with the way we do budgeting and stuff. So, so that said that uh, we want to have goals that we could overperform. Uh, and uh, because I, I don't want to put expectations uh, in the market uh, that I don't believe in myself. Uh, so I'm, I'm, uh, I'm happy to over deliver one. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy if I can deliver uh, like uh, one year in advance uh, this time as well. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that, that makes sense. If we, uh, I mean, it's a good segue because a lot of people who are tuning in are investors in different scale. And, and one of the, the question was from a very good investor in Sweden who asked the question, why should he own the stock or let's make it easy. Why should he be owning this company for the next three to five to 10 years? And I guess one way to answer that is also just tell uh, telling it uh, telling us about the market opportunity and where you're going to position yourself i think of course like uh, i think we definitely will benefit from the big mega trends in retail uh, and uh, because the new consumer behavior um, you really need to be able to meet your customer both both online and in person and it needs to work together and uh, we are an enabler in this space so the market is is growing uh, well uh, in double digits uh, if you look at our company in particular if we have like 10 straight year of uh, arr uh, growth every quarter it's just it's 30 39 quarters in a row so one more quarter and we're in 10 years and it it makes it also really easy to follow the customer as an investor you could like look at the quarter report, the first page, and see are you still <laughs> growing according to plan. Um, and so the downside is really, really low uh, uh, because uh, um, you could always uh, like measure the the sauce revenue at the, any specific point. Uh, always profitable. That uh, it's our mantra. We want to grow with continued profitability. We don't need to have the highest profitability when we grow, but we. We want to grow with profitability. Um, so, and um, our goal now is to reach uh, reach 200 millions in ARR and be like the winner in this uh, niche digital in store. And uh, I think it's a like huge strategic value to be like the infrastructure for the physical retail. Um, and um, that's why you should uh, be owner in Vertisit. If you had to to highlight a risk factor or a black swan event, what would you say then? You could look at the, um, it. It could be from um, competitor side of the business, for example. Uh, if uh, a lot of competitors that we have, if I ask them. Uh, what they see as uh, as their risk, they look at what will happen when Amazon or when Google or when Adobe enter this space. Um, and uh, I actually, we don't want to be a closed system, so we actually love to like integrate to to Adobe, for example. And I think that they will never go that deep in the tech stack. So they go to the endpoint and the playout. Uh, but there might, uh, there might be like a squeeze here. Um, so it, it could happen uh, uh, that, that the, the layer that we have becomes a commodity. 
Um, and that's something that we always like work a lot to to, to avoid. And um, so we need we need to add a lot of like in, intelligence that in, uh, that you can where you can benefit from putting our software in your digital ecosystem where it coexists with your CRM, your PIM system and uh, your e-commerce platform uh, as well. So we want to be on the same strategic level as uh, the other platforms in the technology stack. But of course, there is a risk uh, in that. Makes sense. Uh, finishing up scaling your company, we also need to talk a bit about scaling yourself as a leader and as a business person. How has that journey been, being so consistent, growing all the time, has that been challenging privately or has it just been a great journey for you as well as a leader, suddenly managing two people to 50 people, etc.? cetera? Um, for me, it has been a really good journey. Uh, as I said, I was 24 years old when I started the company and uh, I'm happy that I was, uh, that it took time for me to grow into this <laughs> because you, obviously when you work on the same thing in 10 years, uh all of a sudden you become pretty good at that it it's due to anything if you if you like spend 10 years of skiing you become really good at skiing <laughs> so 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 uh time time is good but it's also like where what why are you into the business um it could be that if uh if we were three people. We re really like uh, the founders. Adrian was really uh, operational guy, uh, also like a finance perspective on things. Um, so he took care of like all internal like processes and routines and stuff. Uh, we had Oscar as the CTO uh, that had like made all the technology decision, and I've been more on the marketing, uh, marketing and sales side. Uh, so we always had like clear roles and you also need to see like are my core um, um, is my core competence valuable in this stage for the company and uh, is this a place where I want to be uh, and you need to be really open when it's not so for example Adrian at one point he said I don't want to be the CFO when we go public um, but he said, I want to have a strategic saying in the board. So then he moved from like uh, operational management into the board. And we had a CFO that we recruited for that, uh, that position. Um, and, uh, but for, um, for me, um, the most interesting thing for me is always like to build, build company. Uh, so for me, when it becomes bigger and bigger, um, I'm, um, I, I still think it's more and more fun uh, when it becomes uh, larger and uh, where, uh, where uh, as still as there are things, things, still things to learn and uh, as long as we deliver on plan, um, I, I think it's a great, a great personal journey as well and I'm never bored. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's great reflections because it isn't right for everyone to be sort of the Jeff Bezos or Mark Zuckerberg because companies that grow change a lot, right? So yeah. certainly when you have when you have scale and you can talk more about this than me, but something as easy or hard as internal politics or hiring or culture will take a large chunk of your time because when you are five guys, I mean the culture is the five persons involved basically. Yeah. I totally agree. So I, I think it, it comes down to to be honest to yourself, like, am I the right for, for the challenge at this particular time? And uh, it's also be true to yourself, like, is this really what I want? And, and, uh, I, and in, in, in my, my case, I, I really like to build companies. <laughs> I think I could build like any time of the comp any type of company it's it, but building companies what what i really love uh, and uh, that uh, and as we like reach certain steps where we could like um, 
it's it's achieving like taking the next step that's what drives me and uh, i think uh, it's more fun now uh, when we are 130 people uh, than it ever been do you have any any leaders or entrepreneurs who inspires you i mean obviously this is a very norwegian ish question to ask because you can always say that daniel ek is the the most incredible founder from Sweden and is taking over the world. But do you have anyone that has inspired you and you even even have met and talked to and been mentored by? Uh, Mia Brunel leave first. Uh, she has been. She was the head of Chinevik. She was my mentor for uh, for two years. Uh, now she's at uh, Axel Jonsson. Um, um, she uh, she is a fantastic leader. Um, and um, she actually she inspired me a lot when it comes to to really build things up on culture instead of like processes. Um, and um, I think I learned a lot from her. Uh, and the good thing that she always had like the business, like the sales, and the, the core of the business is actually always like sales. So and she she managed to like have pure focus on. How do we perform uh, sales-wise, and how do we really like keep the culture in place? And uh, uh, she she have really been an inspiration. But also like I also uh, as others, I'm super impressed. Uh, inspired by Steve Jobs, for example, where he just can have a, like a very clear vision of what we want to achieve. Like really start with why. Uh, what is the what is the overall purpose and take that down to uh, a product in the end and not 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 the other way around did you have any just closing off any any final uh, or some great resources or books that you can recommend or something like that because there's were also some question on twitter about that um that was a good uh, question i might come back to you with, with that but uh, there are obviously things that are uh, really relevant in in different uh, spectra um, but um, i think i come back with uh, the book recommendation let's maybe we can put it in the show notes so when the episode is released we can have some resources if yeah. johan has some, some great tips so i think that's it johan thank you so much for joining it was a pleasure to having you on yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's uh, always interesting to like having uh, a recap of what uh, things that is past. <laughs> yeah. So thank you so much. Hi everyone, Christopher here again. Just a few things before you leave the show. If you like this episode, it would be great if you could give it a review and also share it with your professional network. If you want to get in touch with me, Twitter is the place. Just go to at Chris Wunheim. You can also find this information in the show notes. Hope to see you tune in to the next episode and take care.